Uh, it's good to have you here with us this morning. Let's um, turn in our Bibles to Matthew chapter 21. <clears throat> We're continuing our study verse by verse through the Gospel of Matthew. So last week we took a little detour because it was Resurrection Sunday. And if you look at the resurrection, it says Jesus appeared to the disciples over a 40-day period. So he was crucified on Passover in the tomb for three days. And then for the next 40 days, he appeared to the disciples. And then a week before Pentecost, he ascended up into heaven. And then Pentecost, a week later, that's when the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples. The church was born. So if you look chronologically, uh, this has nothing to do with the message, by the way. Um, so tomorrow would be the eighth day since Jesus resurrected from the grave. And it was on that eighth day that he appeared to the disciples in that closed room in the home. And uh, Thomas, who was known as Doubting Thomas, was there with them. And it was Thomas the week before on Resurrection Sunday evening when Jesus appeared. And they told Thomas, hey, we saw the Lord. Thomas wasn't there. And he was like, oh, I'm not going to believe unless I can put my finger in the hole in his hand and my hand in the hole in his side. And so... Eight days later, which would be like tomorrow, uh, he appeared to the disciples and Thomas was there. And he says, hey, Tom, come over here. You know, stick your finger here in the hole of my hand. Put your hand in my side. See, it's me. Don't be unbelieving, but believe. And that's when Thomas cried out, my Lord and my God. And he said, Thomas, because you have seen me and you believe, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. And that's you and I. We haven't seen the Lord, but we know He is true. He is real. We know a lot of different ways, prophecy from His Word, archaeologically, historically, it all points to Jesus Christ. And so we are those who haven't seen, yet we believe. So let's open up in a word of prayer, and uh, we'll pick up here in Matthew 21, verse 23. Father, once again, we count it a privilege to come before you and to be together as your body, worshiping you in spirit and truth. We thank you, Lord, that we can gather together to look at your word, and we just pray that your word this morning would just stir us up to have that hunger for your word throughout the week. Lord, we'd have those times in the morning or in the evening where we just let your Holy Spirit take your word and speak to our hearts. And we pray, Father, that you would be glorified in all that we say and do, and that all of us here would be edified as your word goes forth, that sharp two-edged sword, may you pierce us with your love and with your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're entering the final few days, chronologically, of Jesus' uh, ministry on earth. And we left off before um, Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, with Jesus riding into Jerusalem on the little donkey and what has become known as the triumphal entry. Um, that's when all the people are proclaiming, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, or save now. And everybody's excited about the Messiah of Israel. And as he is being hailed as the king of Israel, one of the first things he does is goes up on the Temple Mount and he starts flipping over the money changers' tables. And then he drives them off, these hypocrites who are, you know, just religious guys ripping off the people. And he tells them, my house shall be called a house of prayer. You've made it a den of thieves. And so the religious leaders are very upset with Jesus. And so in the next couple of chapters, they set out to try and trip him up. They set out to try to trap him in his own words, which is kind of funny because Jesus has all wisdom all knowledge at his disposal. He'll expose them for the hypocrites that they are. So Jesus now goes back to the temple. This is the next day after Palm Sunday. And he immediately is confronted by these religious leaders. So chapter 21, verse 23 says, Now when he came into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people confronted him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? In other words, they want to know who gave Jesus the authority to overturn the money changers' tables, to drive off these religious leaders of Israel. On the one hand, these chief priests and elders, they're considered the official guardians of the law of Moses. 
And so it was their duty to question anybody that would say, I'm the Messiah. Because a lot of people did over the years. And they would question those who would say, I'm sent from God. And so that was good. They needed to question anyone who claimed to be coming in the name of the Lord. However, on the other hand, these guys aren't really seeking the truth. These guys are jealous. These guys are envious. And, and they're, they're not looking at the will of God or the word of God, but they are more concerned about holding on to their own power and their own position. That's their bottom line. Verse 24, so they're asking him, what authority are you doing these things? Jesus answered and said to them, I also will ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I will likewise uh, will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, where was it from? From heaven or from men? Pause there for a moment. So these religious leaders who claim to be the biblical authorities, the spiritual authorities in Israel, they're going to quickly learn and discover that Jesus is the real authority. What he says goes. And it's been rightly stated that God will reveal truth to us, but then if we reject the truth he's given us, he's not going to give us more truth if we reject the fundamentals that he's given us. And so these guys... They're rejecting everything about Jesus. He's been mir doing miracles. He's been feeding multitudes. I mean, he's done all these things, and yet they're still rejecting him. And so he says, okay, tell me, you know, what do you guys think? John the Baptist, what did he do this? How did he do this? Was it with the authority of God from heaven or what, just men? Was this just another guy showing up? They were not going to believe the testimony of John the Baptist. And if they weren't going to believe his testimony that Jesus is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is the one John was pointing to. He was a forerunner for Jesus. They're going to reject him. So why would Jesus waste his time trying to convince them otherwise? The sad thing was they thought they knew the word of God. The problem is they did not know the God of the word. And there's a huge difference. A lot of people know a lot about God. They know a lot about the Word of God, but they don't know the God who has given us the very Word of God. Jesus, it's all about Him anyway, right? We see this over and over again, and I use this verse constantly, John chapter 5, verses 39 and 40, where Jesus says, You search the Scriptures. He's talking to the Pharisees. You search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. And then he says, but you're not willing to come to me that you may have life. So everything from Genesis and for us to Revelation is the word of God. It all points to Jesus. But the problem all along was that these guys, they searched the Bible, but they did not see Jesus in the word of God. Again, they know a lot about God, but they did not understand the scriptures concerning Jesus. It was all about the Lord. So, verse 25, halfway through, after Jesus says, okay, tell me, where did he get his authority? Is it from heaven or from men? And they reason among themselves, saying, if we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say from men, we fear the multitude, for all count John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus and said, we don't know. And he said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. I mean, these guys are caught between a rock and a hard place. They know and they remember what John the Baptist said to them. John is the one that called them out. Brood of vipers. You know, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? You're going to be burned up in unquenchable fire. You know, you're going to be like chaff blown away. John told them, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Again, he said, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, pointing to Jesus. So as these guys reason among themselves, they're thinking, well, if we say John was from heaven, Jesus will say, well, why didn't you believe him? How come you didn't put your faith in me? He was pointing to me. But if we say Jesus, you know, to Jesus, John was just a man. He wasn't anything spiritual. Then the people are going to be upset with us. They're going to come after us because they looked at John as a prophet. Either way, we're hosed. That's what they're thinking. They say to Jesus, we do not know. 
which was the cowardly thing to say. And so this is why Jesus did not answer their questions, because he did not want to endorse or enter into their hypocrisy. This goes back to what John says in John chapter 1, starting in verse 10, where we read that he, Jesus, was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, the Jewish people, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. And so Jesus is going to put these guys on the hot seat, and he will show them how they have abused their authority. In fact, Jesus is going to start talking about some parables here, and he's going to make these guys pronounce judgment upon themselves. It's going to get good. Because these guys think they know the right answers, and yet the Lord's going to show them, you have abused God's people, you have misused your authority, you've come against God's prophets. And so these guys, they refused to listen to what God was saying. For over a thousand years, God sent them prophets. So look at verse 28. Jesus says, but what do you think? A man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward, he regretted it and went. Then he came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said to him, The first. Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But tax collectors and harlots believed him. And when you saw it, you did not afterward relent and believe him. And so in this first parable here, Jesus makes a couple of very important points. First of all, he immediately interprets the parable by linking it to John the Baptist. Thus, Jesus is affirming John did indeed come from heaven. That's where his authority came from. Jesus tells him, John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. Now, the first son in this parable who initially refused to obey his father, and he did not work in the field, the vineyard, he represented this, the rebellious sinners in Israel. And he says, the tax collectors and the harlots, they're the ones that they were living a wicked lifestyle. And when the word of God went forth, they're like, nah, I don't want anything to do with that. But then John's preaching repentance. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. They were humbled. And they humbled themselves before the Lord. And they got saved. But when the, these religious leaders, they're the second son, when they show up, they think they're all self-righteous. They think they don't need to repent. And when they were called out as a brood of vipers and so forth, they're like, we don't want to listen to this guy. And so they did not humble themselves. Matthew, the guy that writes the Gospel of Matthew, he was one of those tax collectors that Jesus is referring to because the tax collectors were ripping off their fellow Jews. They were collecting money for Rome from the Jewish people. So they were despised. And they would rip people off because they could keep whatever they made extra to what they were required to give the Romans. Harlots, obviously, they're practicing prostitution. And yet, when the Word of God went forth, they were broken. They were humbled, and they received Jesus. They received, first of all, John the Baptist's message, but they would become followers of Christ. In fact, I'm sure a lot of these women that were following Jesus have been set free from a lot of stuff. We know Mary Magdalene, we don't know if she was a prostitute or not, but she had seven demons. She was very messed up. She was, had many illnesses, it said. And then the Lord got a hold of her life and radically changed her and saved her. So these, the second son, these religious leaders, they looked great on the outside. They did their religious duties. But when John the Baptist called them to repent of their sinful ways, their self-righteousness, their greed, their superior attitude over the other people, they refused to humble themselves. You might say, they were all show but no go. 
They knew all the right things to say, but they were not following the ways of the Lord. So Jesus is flat out telling these guys, all those people that you condemn as unworthy to go to heaven, they'll be there, but you won't. You're not going to make it unless you repent of your sins and turn to God. And these guys, it says they did not relent. They didn't humble themselves. They did not turn to the Lord. I can guarantee that Jesus' words did not sit very well with these guys. In fact, by the end of this chapter, they're ready to kill him. They wanted to just string him up right then and there. Well, look at verse 33. He gives them another parable. He says, Here another parable. There was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a tower. And he leased it to vine dressers and went into a far country. Jesus is on the Temple Mount. Again, there's thousands and thousands of people on the Temple Mount at this time. This is still during Passover week. It's just getting started. And so there's a lot of people there. He's not just speaking to the religious leaders, but multitudes are hanging on every word. And so as he begins this parable, all of them would quickly recognize what Jesus is talking about. They know the landowner that he mentions here. Well, that's God. He planted a vineyard. They know that's our, our land, our nation, Israel. God set a hedge of protection around Israel. It says he put a tower in there. God would watch over his people from the tower. The wine press would symbolize a good harvest. The vine dressers, that's these religious people that were supposed to be caring for the people of Israel, teaching them the things about the Lord. In a moment, we'll see that the landowner would send servants, which we'll find are prophets who were mistreated by these vine dressers. Why would they know this? Because God often refers to Israel as God's vineyard, and God is the one who has established the vineyard. By the clearest reference we see um, to what Jesus is saying here, it's found in Isaiah chapter 5. Look at these verses, starting in verse 1. The first two verses are Isaiah speaking to the Lord, and the last five verses are the Lord speaking about the people of Israel. Isaiah starts off saying, Now let me sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. So this little song speaks of God's loving care for his vineyard, the Jews in Israel. My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill, again, the land of Israel. He dug it up, cleared out its stones. That would be all of Israel's enemies that he drove out from before them. Not all of them got you know, kicked out because the Jews did not go all the way like they should have. Anyway, cleared out its stones and planted it with the choicest vine. This would be God's chosen people, the people that he loved. The, they were an apple in his eye. He built a tower in its midst. Again, God would watch over them. God is our strong tower. And also made a wine press in it, so he expected it to bring forth grapes. They wanted, God wanted love, you know, true worship, righteousness, obedience, service. But, Isaiah says, it brought forth wild grapes. In other words, they got into idolatry. They were in rebellion. They are disobedient to the Lord and His Word. Now God speaks up. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge please between me and my vineyard, the Jews. What more could I have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why then, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth Wild grapes. Again, sour, bitter grapes. I mean, God did so much for the Jewish people. I mean, He's the one that established them in the land, drove out their enemies. God gave them the very word of God. God sent them prophets. He protected them. He did everything for them, and yet they continued to rebel against the Lord, against His word, against the prophets. Verse 5 there says, And now, please let me tell you, what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge. Think of a hedge of protection around Israel. And it shall be burned and break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned or dug, but there shall come up briars and thorns. And God would do this 
under the hand of King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian Empire. Isaiah is prophesying about the Babylonians coming in and destroying the nation of Judah, taking many into captivity. He says, I will also command the clouds that the ra they rain no rain on it, for the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah are his pleasant plant. He looked for justice, but behold, oppression. For righteousness, but behold, a cry for help. And so Jesus begins to give this parable to the religious leaders. And as he does, all the people know exactly what he's referring to. Look at verse 34. Now when vintage time drew near, he sent his servants to the vine dressers that they might receive its fruit. Again, as vintage time drew near, the Lord is expecting you know, a good harvest, a harvest of love, joy, worship, obedience, and so forth. The servants of God are, are God's prophets here, verse 35, and the vine dressers took his servants, beat one, killed one, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants, more than the first. These are the prophets. And they did likewise to them. That's exactly what the leaders did to God's prophets. Most were rejected. Jeremiah, who prophesied during the Babylonian invasion and so forth. Forty years he prophesied before and during the Babylonian invasion. They didn't want to hear what he had to say. They locked him up in prison. I mean, he was mistreated horribly. History says that King Manasseh, a wicked king, in Judah, he had Isaiah son in two. I mean, they did not treat these prophets very well. Look at what Jesus will say to these religious leaders when we get there. I don't know when, but Matthew 23, verse 33, Jesus says to them, Serpents, brood of vipers. Oh, Jesus never says anything harsh, does he? <laughs> he does to the religious leaders. How can you escape the condemnation of hell? Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men, and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. And that would take place as the church in Jerusalem started to grow. They were persecuted. Paul, Saul of Tarsus, was one of the guys that did tremendous harm, persecution of the church there. But be that as it may, Jesus says this is what's going to happen. Verse 37, Then last of all, he sent his son. So the owner of the vineyard sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. Now Isaiah said nothing about this. This would have got their minds reeling. What do you mean? God has a son? What's he talking about here? I mean, they're, they're not sure what's going on here because the landowner, God, he's going to send a son. That would certainly get their attention. God the Father has a son. Jesus has already spoken of this to one of their religious leaders. Remember Nicodemus? Nick at night comes there in John chapter 3, and they get into this conversation. You know the famous verse there, John 3, 16. He tells Nicodemus, For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Both Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea would become followers of the Son of God. And according to the book of Acts, many priests, and I think Jesus is planting the seeds here, and many of these priests are going to get saved, maybe at Pentecost, shortly thereafter, but many of these priests would come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Acts chapter 6, verse 7. We read, Then the word of God spread, and it's talking about in Jerusalem here, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many priests were obedient to the faith. So Jesus planting the seeds, and you know, Peter comes along on the day of Pentecost, preaches the gospel, 3,000 get saved. Short time later, in Acts chapter 3, 2,000 more get saved as he heals that guy that was begging for alms at the gate beautiful. Silver and gold I don't have, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And the guy's healed, and everybody comes to Peter like he's some great thing. He goes, no, 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 I'm just a man. I'm just a human. And he gives them the gospel, and 2,000 more get saved. So a lot's happening at that time. 
So Jesus is planting the seeds. Again, verse 37. Then last of all, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the vine dressers, that's the religious leaders in Israel, saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. So they took him and cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Again, the vine dressers, these religious leaders in Israel, they've already been plotting how can we put Jesus to death. After Lazarus got raised from the dead, they're looking how they can put Jesus to death, how they can put Lazarus to death. That was a testimony that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And so even though this is a parable, Jesus is letting them know that he knows what they're going to do to him. They're going to put the son to death. The amazing thing about this is Jesus is actually going to have them pronounce judgment upon themselves in front of all the people. Verse 40, Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, speaking of God, what will he do to those vine dressers, the religious leaders? What do you think, the, you know, you guys, what do you think the owner is going to do to those who killed the servants, who killed his son? Verse 41, they said to him, he will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to other vine dressers who will render to him the fruits in their seasons. These guys are so caught up in the parable that Jesus is telling them that they don't even realize they just condemned themselves. I wonder how many of the common folk were listening to this, you know, hearing these things, or, you know, snickering under their breath, chuckling like, these guys don't even realize Jesus is talking about them. And they're condemning themselves. They're telling Jesus, that landowner, he's going to destroy those wicked men because they killed his son. Then he's going to lease his vineyard to others who will give him the fruits in their seasons. Well, that's prophetic. God would do a new work. He would establish his church on the day of Pentecost. It would be made up of Jews and Gentiles. That forms the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. And so it would include anyone who would come to Christ by faith. But these, these guys are true. He's going to destroy those wicked vine dressers. So picking up on what these religious leaders said, he makes it perfectly clear how they just condemned themselves. Verse 42, Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the Scriptures? This is like the fourth or fifth time he tells them this. Come on, you're the religious leaders. Have you never read this? They knew the Bible, the Old Testament, inside and out. They could give you, they didn't have chapters and verses, but they could tell you, you know, right here in this part of the scroll of Isaiah, it says this, they were very, very knowledgeable, but they did not know the God of the Word. Jesus is quoting from Psalm 118 when he says, The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Psalm 118, this is the last of the six Hallel Psalms. These are the Psalms that they would sing every Passover. And it could have been Psalm 118. Remember after Jesus you know, does Passover with the disciples, he washes their feet. Then they leave and they go down the Kidron Valley. They go up to the Mount of Olives, to the Garden of Gethsemane. And it says that they left. They were singing a psalm to the Lord. It's probably Psalm 118. And this was part of that psalm, the stone which the builders rejected. Look at Psalm 118, verse 22. It says, the stone which the builders rejected, that's Jesus, has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. So here's Jesus saying to these religious leaders, have you never read the scriptures? It's almost like he could have said, come on, guys. Yesterday, everybody in Jerusalem was singing Psalm 118 to Jesus. Remember when he's riding on the donkey, what are they singing? Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the son of David. That's from Psalm 118. They all would have said this. Have you never read this? Uh, come on, we just heard that yesterday. Yeah, it's all about me. 
Again, they knew a lot about the Word of God, but they did not know the Creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who has given us the Bible. So verse 43, Jesus says, Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away or taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. And whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. Jesus is the stone. He is the rock. And here he makes it very clear that all people will either fall upon the rock, Jesus, and be humbled. And if you do, then you can receive forgiveness. You can receive salvation. You can be given everlasting life if you humble yourself and fall on the rock. Or you reject him, say, I don't want anything to do with him. I don't want the gospel. Jesus is this and that and the other. Then he, the rock, will fall on you and grind you to powder. That's quite the picture he's given us here. Do you know where this image comes from? It comes from the book of Daniel. It's when King Nebuchadnezzar had his infamous dream of that huge statue. And in that dream, you know, he, he has the dream and then he's all troubled and he calls all the wise men of Babylon, try to, you know, give me my dream. He says, first of all, tell me what I dreamt. <laughs> we can't do that. You got to tell us what the dream is. No, I know you guys. You got to tell me what I dreamt and then give me the interpretation and I'll let you live. That's a bad scenario. And so Nebuchadnezzar literally starts putting them to death. Word comes to Daniel. He was young. He was working in the courts, being reprogrammed by Babylon. He wouldn't be reprogrammed. But he said, wait a minute. I, I can interpret dreams. Um, let me pray about this. They bring Daniel to Nebuchadnezzar. Can you interpret dreams? Well, I can't, but I know the one who can. And so he, Daniel tells him. You had a dream, and in this dream you saw a big giant statue, and it was a head of gold, it was chest of silver, it had a belly of bronze, it had legs of iron, and then feet, iron mixed with clay. And in your dream you saw this rock, not cut with hands, it struck the image, and the whole thing turned to chaff. It was ground to powder and blew away in the wind. Nebuchadnezzar's, you know, blown away. That is the dream. And then Daniel says, let me interpret it for you. You, Nebuchadnezzar, you're the head of gold, the Babylonian Empire. But you're going to be replaced by the chest of silver. That's the Medo-Persian Empire. It happened in Daniel chapter 5 when they got underneath the Babylonian walls and they captured it just that night. It wasn't a big battle, but the Medo-Persian Empire, led by King Cyrus, takes over. Babylon is done. Now you got Medo-Persian Empire. The, the belly of uh, bronze is the Greek Empire, led by Alexander the Great. He would destroy the Medo-Persian Empire. But then, not too long later, the Roman Empire, let the, the iron legs, would conquer the, um, the Greeks. And that was the situation when Jesus was on the scene. It was the Roman Empire that was in charge. But then he says in the last days, there's going to be the feet of iron mixed with clay. And it's a revised Roman Empire. That's going to be led by the Antichrist. The stone not cut with hands is Jesus, and when he comes back, he will strike that image, and it all crumbles. And then, because it says the mountain, uh, or the stone not cut with hands, it, it turns it into dust, powder, but then that rock turns into a mountain that covers the whole earth. This is speaking of Jesus being the King of kings, the Lord of lords, his kingdom here on earth. So that is the, you know, the picture we have here. Jesus has an everlasting kingdom. So the bottom line is Jesus is letting these religious leaders know he is the king, he is the Lord. They can either come to him broken, humble, and be saved, or they can resist him and he will grind them to powder. Quite the picture. How do you think they took what Jesus said? Verse 45. Now, when the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking of them. Wait a minute! This guy's talking about us! Yeah, you think? 
But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitudes because they took him for a prophet. So they didn't take it very well. They knew this parable was about them. But again, instead of humbling themselves, being broken before the Lord, they grew angrier, their hearts grew harder. And as we go through the scriptures, we see that Jesus is the rock. He's the rock of offense. He's the rock that people stumble over. He's the one that, you know, people that are religious trip over Jesus and His grace and His mercy. Even this was prophesied in the Old Testament. Look at this verse, Isaiah 8, verse 14. It tells us about the Messiah. He will be a sanctuary, praise the Lord, but a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel as a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Israel. Jerusalem. If you come to him all self-righteous in your religion and you don't see your need for Jesus, you're going to stumble. You're going to trip over that. 1 Corinthians 1.22, the Apostle Paul says, For the Jews request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block, and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Jesus loves everybody. Jesus died for everybody. He is the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father but through Him. You either humble yourself and come to Christ, and you will be saved, or you can be like the religious guys thinking, oh, I don't really need to humble myself before Jesus. I got it all figured out. That's why Jesus said earlier, the tax collectors, the harlots, they're going to get in because they were broken. They humbled themselves. I'm sure many of you have friends or relatives. They're into all kinds of you know, religious stuff. They worship all kinds of stuff. It could be the jolly green giant. It could be the green goddess of Mother Earth. That's a big thing today. People are worshiping Mother Earth. I mean, it can be so many different things people put their hope in, their trust in. Jesus is still the rock of offense. And you can talk about anything, you can bring up anything, but as soon as you talk about Jesus, either the conversation ends right then, or they want to debate and argue and they get all mad and upset. It shouldn't surprise us because Jesus said this is what was going to happen. Look at this verse. We saw it months ago, Matthew 10, 34. Do not think, Jesus says, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. And he talks about, you know, parents will be upset with their kids, you know, wife against her husband, husband against her kids, blah, 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 you know, the whole thing. But I thought he came to bring peace on earth, goodwill toward men. At a second coming, he will. He'll establish his kingdom on earth. But right now, no, it's a division. There's a sword that was drawn because you're either for Jesus or you're against him. Jesus is the stone. He is the rock. And people either stumble and trip over him or, like Paul says, build your life on that sure foundation. He's the rock that we build our lives on. He says, be careful how you build on that foundation. Jesus is the immovable foundation stone which is awesome because He guarantees us our safety, our security, but it's only in Him. Not in the things of this world, but it's in Christ. So we're going to move quickly through this parable in chapter 22 because it's all the same scenario, same scene here. And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son and sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding. And they were not willing to come. How sad. Jesus came to his own, but his own received him not. This parable gives us a powerful picture of the father arranging the marriage supper, the wedding feast, for his son Jesus. And even as the invitation goes out to the people, they weren't willing to come. Same is true today. But notice it says in verse 4, again, in other words, that's God's grace. He could have said, okay, you rejected, you're toast. Again, he sends more prophets, more people, more servants. Again, he sent out other servants saying, tell those who are invited. 
See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted cattle are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. Again, God has prepared everything for his wedding feast. Jesus is preparing it for you and for me. John chapter 14. Look at these verses. Some of my favorite. Verses 2 and 3. In my Father's house are many mansions. If I were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So all things are ready. The invitation's out there. Come to the wedding, verse 5. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his own farm, another to his business, and the rest seized his servants. God's, you know, people that are proclaiming the gospel, the, the prophets, you know, of old. They seized them, they treated them spitefully, and killed them. There are always people who make light of the prophecies of God. They mock the scriptures. They mock the fact that Jesus is coming back for his bride. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. He's going to catch up those who are dead in Christ. We who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air. The rapture? You're nuts! I can't believe that! You're nuts. You're crazy. Well, this is what Peter says, 2 Peter 3, verse 3. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, those who mock these things, walking according to their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. In other words, they're just mocking. People have said that for years, 2,000 years. People have said Jesus is coming back. Well, Peter goes on to say, well, with the Lord, you know, a thousand years is like a day. A day is like a thousand years. So from God's perspective, Jesus has only been gone for two days. And we're stressed out. We're, oh, come on quickly, Lord. And he's like, I got it. Don't worry. I got everything under control. Meantime, come to Jesus. The invitation has been sent out. And from our perspective, what is the invitation? It's the gospel. Letting people know Jesus paid the price. He went to the cross willingly. It wasn't an accident that they arrested him and you know, betrayed him and he ends up on a cross. That was no accident. He came for that express purpose. The Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. So he dies on the cross, shedding his blood. That's the only acceptable payment for our sins. They put the sword in his, up his side, up into his heart, out pours blood and water. He's dead. They bury him in the tomb. Third day, he rises from the dead. That's the gospel. 1 Corinthians 5, verses 1 through 4. This is the gospel by which we are saved if we stand fast on this truth. He died on the third. He died for our sins, ro buried, rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And he was seen by all these people. He was seen by over 500 people at once. We have good news to share with people. Jesus paid the price in full. He took upon himself all the wrath and judgment for our sins that we deserve. And because he rose from the dead, he alone can offer you the free gift of eternal life. You can say, nah, I don't want that invitation. Take it away. He's not going to force you into the kingdom of God against your will. He created us with a free will. You see that in the Garden of Eden. When he said to Adam and Eve, I've given you all you know, trees. You can probably millions of trees. You can eat from any of them. But this one tree you cannot eat from. For the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. So God, in His sovereignty, created man with a free will. They freely chose to eat from that forbidden fruit. And they died. Spiritually, they died at that very moment. So here's Jesus paying the price in full to redeem us back to the Father. And it's only because He's alive forevermore that He can save you, give you eternal life, wash all of your sins away. But you must come to Christ. Fifty times in the Gospel of John, John says you must believe. For God so loved the world, Jesus said, whoever believes in Him, you know, will not perish but have everlasting life. Anyway, I digress. Verse 7, but when the king heard about it, how they spitefully treated and killed these servants, when the king heard about it, he was furious. And he sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. 
Then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. This seems to be a reference to the Lord allowing the Romans to destroy Jerusalem in 70 A.D. Again, it was all because these religious leaders hated Jesus, they despised him, they rejected him as their Messiah. And yes, God used a wicked foreign power like the Romans to destroy and judge his people. He did it with Nebuchadnezzar. And you ladies going through the book of Habakkuk, you know that. Habakkuk is like, God, why would you use the Babylonians to judge us? I know we're bad, but we're not as bad as those guys. And we're thinking of these other nations in the world. God, we're a righteous nation. No, we're not. 60 million abortions? Our hands are bloody. Our hands are dirty. We deserve the wrath of God. And we're going to get the wrath of God, but we won't as believers. We'll be out of here. But this nation will be judged for what it's done. And so God will use anyone. He calls Nebuchadnezzar my servant, Nebuchadnezzar. Isn't that crazy? That guy was wicked until he did get saved, I believe. But he used General Titus in 70 AD, slaughtered a million Jews in Jerusalem, leveled the temple. It was horrible. Look at verse 9. Therefore, go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So those servants went into the highways and gathered together all they found, both bad and good. Which one are we? I don't know. Bad and good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. This is a reference to us, the Lord's church. His invitation has gone forth for the last 2,000 years. It began on Pentecost. 3,000 get saved. It'll be completed at the rapture. That's the church from Pentecost to the rapture. So right now we're to continue. Go to the highways, it says here. The byways, the trails in Africa and India and Asia, South America, wherever, take the gospel, the invitation. Come to Christ. He can forgive you. He can save you. I believe personally that when the last person comes to Christ and they give their life to Jesus, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ will be complete and then the rapture will take place. Amazing. That's the bride, the body of Christ, from the rapture, or from Pentecost to the rapture. People want to know, well, what about those who get saved during the Great Tribulation? Well, they're known as Tribulation Saints. They're saved, but they're not the bride of Christ. They have a different relationship. Just like the Old Testament saints, they have a different relationship with God. Three different groups, all blessed beyond comprehension, that we will be saved in the presence of the Lord. But it's only from... Pentecost to the rapture that the bride of Christ is established. Because then we go to the marriage supper of the Lamb when we're out of here. That's going to be amazing. So if you're the last person and you haven't given your life to Christ, hurry up and give your life to Christ so we can get out of here. <laughs> I'm being facetious, but you know what I mean. God knows the time. And Jesus will come for us at the right time. He'll snatch us out of here and we will be with Him in glory. Verse 11. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. In those days, if you were invited to the wedding, the host would give you the wedding garment. It was a light, bright linen that everybody would wear. Picture when we get into the glory of the Lord, Revelation chapter 19, verse 8 says that we are dressed in fine, bright linen, bright and clean. In chapter 19, verse 15, when Jesus is on his white horse and he comes through heaven, comes back to earth at his second coming, it says the armies of heaven clothed in fine linen, bright and clean, are following him on white horses. So we are going to be clothed with his righteous garments. That's what it refers to, his robes of righteousness. It's a free gift. Nobody can earn these robes. Nobody deserves these robes. But if you were invited and you accept the invitation, he clothes you with his robes of righteousness. So this one guy, how did he get in there? This is a parable. We don't make doctrine off of this. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. Again, the gospel invitation goes out to many, but few people receive it. 
you know, remember what we saw, the parable in, uh, of the sower in chapter 13. Four different types of soil representing the human heart. The seed all goes out to him, lands in the hard pack, the enemy comes, takes it right out. Nothing changed. There's the shallow soil, seeds planted. It grows up quickly, but then as soon as the sun comes out, persecution, tribulation, trials, it quickly withers away and dies. There's no fruit. The other one falls in the soil with all the weeds, and it grows up, and it says it's choked out because of the cares of this world, the riches of this world. Choke it out. There's only one that produces good fruit, the soil that is good, it says. And the seed lands in that soil. It's the human heart. So the invitation goes out, but few will actually deny themselves, take up the cross, and follow Jesus. Jesus already taught about this. Look at Matthew 7. Verses 13 and 14, I'll wrap it up here. He says, enter by the narrow gate. This is what Jesus says. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. As Jesus said, it's weeping and gnashing of teeth. And there are many who go in by it because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. Some people today say, all roads lead to heaven. Nope. One road leads to heaven. That's through Jesus. He's the narrow gate. He's the door of salvation. All roads do lead to the great white throne, where they'll be sentenced to the lake of fire for eternity. You don't want to be on that road. That's why it's wide. That's why many are going on that road, he says. Make sure you're giving your life to Jesus. You gave your life to Him. He began this good work. He's faithful to complete it, so stay walking close to Him. He's got you safe and secure in His hands. Make sure you're in Christ, because He alone can save you by His grace. Last verses, Matthew 7, 21. This kind of correlates to this guy, or you know, he says, Friend, how did you come in here? You don't even have a garment on. Well, Matthew 7, 21, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? A lot of false prophets out there. Just watch TBN for a short amount of time and you will see what he's talking about. Many will say to me that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Cast out demons in your name, in Jesus' name. I don't know why you have to say it like that to think God's going to work. But they throw his name around. They think it's like abracadabra, Jesus' name, and you'll get whatever you want. Nope. Done many wonders in your name. Be healed. Well, God can heal, but he doesn't have to heal. Well, well, Jesus goes to the pool of Bethesda. It says when he comes into the pool of Bethesda, there are multitudes of people with all these different infirmities and illnesses and, you know, whatever. And he singles out one guy who couldn't walk. And he says, do you want to be made well? The guy starts debating him. There's nobody to put me in the water when the pool stirred up. Because they had an idea that the first one in the water when the pool stirred up, an angel of the Lord will come and heal that person. Well, if you were really messed up and you couldn't do anything, you know, you'd be trying to flop your way over because you saw the pool stirred up. Some guy's got a hangnail. Oh, I'm in. They think they're healed. So it's not good. But there's multitudes. Jesus looks at the multitudes, but he only singles out that one guy. You want to be made well. And the guy debates with Jesus. Oh, look, there's nobody putting me in the water. All he had to say was, yes. But he didn't know who Jesus was. So Jesus tells him, take up your mat and walk. And the guy's instantly healed. God can do that, but he doesn't say he's going to do that for everybody. There's a lot of people. They're not healed. It's not because of their lack of faith. You think Paul had a lack of faith when he said, I got this thorn in my side, whatever it was. God, I plead with you. And it says he pleaded with God three times, remove that thorn in the flesh. And God said, no, my grace is sufficient for you. And Paul realized, okay, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. In my flesh, I'm weak, but I'm going to be strong in the power of the Lord, and He can use me no matter what. If I'm in a wheelchair, if I you know, can't see, whatever it might be, God can use you in tremendous ways. It's not dependent on you. It's just saying, here I am, Lord. You created me. 
Remember what God tells Moses? Am I the one that made the blind and I made the tongue can't speak? I made those deaf? God's the one that creates us. There's value in every human being, no matter how they're born. It's amazing how these false prophets turn it around. And, oh, it's your lack of faith if you're not healed. Baloney. Many will say, you know, we've done all these wonderful things in your name. Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You who have your 100,000 square foot mansions, you fly around in your $65 million jets. They're going to be the ones like, Lord, I did all this. And you can, no. You practice lawlessness. You are ripping off people. You're like the money changers tripling the costs to give somebody that wants to worship Jesus, wants to worship the Lord. They just want to take their lamb. Nope, we don't approve of that lamb. We'll sell you this one. It's only three or four times more expensive. I mean, they're ripping off the people, and that's how Jesus feels about these that are ripping off God's people. He'll flip over the money changers' tables. On that happy note, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness and your grace, your mercy upon us. Lord, we see so much confusion in the church today. We see so many people ripping off Christians, coming up with new and improved revelations and doctrines that are just from the enemy. Lord, I pray that we would have ears to hear what your Spirit says to us from your Word. Lord, it's you speaking to our hearts individually throughout the week as we open up the Scriptures and allow your Spirit to minister to us. Lord, we are so thankful that you got a hold of sinners like us because we know there's none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And yet, we understand that the wages of our sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. And Lord, we thank you that you save sinners like us. We were like the tax collectors. We were like the harlots. We were like those who had rebelled in wicked ways and so many different things. And yet, in your grace, you broke us. You humbled us. And we came to you with nothing. We could give you nothing. And Lord, you gave us eternal life. You've washed all of our sins away. And Lord, you're preparing a place for us in glory. And we look forward to that day when we see you face to face. And only then will there be no more tears, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more death, no more illnesses, disabilities, Lord, it's all going to be done away with. And you'll give us resurrection bodies and we'll be able to be in your presence for eternity. And Lord, again, our my BB brain cannot comprehend how good you are. But we thank you and we praise you. And Lord, help us to get that invitation out to those who are just struggling, who are hurting right now in this world. You are this world's only hope. We just want to commit our ways to you and be light. We pray that we'd be salt to those around us in the power of your Holy Spirit, because, Lord, we are weak, but you are strong. And we commit these things to you, Father, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.